We got some old school chats. Welcome. How many people stole their album off Napster? All right, at least you're honest. Right? All right, so you're here. Good morning. You've heard a bit about me. Uh, I don't feel really the need to repeat this other than to quote P.D. Pablo, who apparently most of you are not going to know, but he has, all right, we're just going to skip this part. Here we go. All right, so normally this is a presentation that I give to people who do not give a flying F about mental health, right? There are folks who may have never heard these terms, who don't realize that it's important yet, and it's my job to help them understand why it matters. That's probably not you, right? So I'm not here this morning to prove anything to you about the importance of this topic. Rather, I've decided that my job this morning is to piss you off. Why? Because it's going to get you riled up, and what else is better at 9.15 or whatever time it is? Also, it'll get you talking, and hopefully it'll bring you to come up and talk to me, which is very good for business. From there, I want to point out that you already know this is important, and while I was joking before, I do honestly want to thank you for being here. Uh, there are a lot of other places you could have been with your weekend. There are a lot of other subjects you could have decided to take interest in or maybe even dedicate your life to, but you chose this, and that puts you at the forefront, which is, we'll talk a little bit about how that is both a blessing and a responsibility, but I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for being a part of this movement with me and with all of us here at NAMI. So our mission for today is to further develop that language of bravery, right? Um, and to kind of give ourselves a vocabulary of healing that we can then go out and share to the world. So, Kanye image number one, thank you very much. All right, put your hands up if you've ever heard the phrase mental health before. Okay, put your hands up if, you've ever, if you have ever heard the phrase mental illness before. Okay, please look around. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Please look around and notice how many people have their hands up. Every one of them. Please keep your hands up. Look around. The people that you are looking at, are the choir. Please place your hands down. One of the privileges of speaking at a conference like this and attending a conference like this is that we get to talk to the choir. We get to preach to people who, for the most part, agree with us. Now, of course, mental health is complicated. There are so many nuances and different facets that we can all debate and go back and forth on because we know about this topic, right? But for the most part, I have to imagine that all of us here today agree that this is at least important enough to spend a Saturday morning on. What I'm interested in are the kids who don't come to church, the folks who have moved so far from town just <laughs> If we are going to reach those folks who don't want to come to church, we're going to have to work on contact. You're more than welcome to come in, or you can just stand at the door, whatever you prefer. We're a safe we, we haven't stopped laughing yet. I'm Mike Rosen. Anyway. <laughs> Just recruiting here. Uh, context is going to be key. You'd have a really hard time explaining to someone that water is H2O if they didn't know what the periodic table of the elements were. You're like, it's two parts hydrogen, bro. And they have no idea what you're talking about. Right? So what we're going to have to do today is create a bit of a context, a fabric, for this conversation. The part that I skipped over in my intro is that most of what I'm interested in my work is not really the content of our conversations, but the context in which it occurs. I'm less interested in the pattern that's on the quilt than the textile we're making the quilt out of. Because to me, if we're not working with the right fabric, then we're never going to be able to stitch the thing that we really want to make. So we'll come back to context. Whoops, you're not supposed to see that yet. All right. You are all super well educated on mental health, probably, more or less, maybe. That said, I want you to put on your imaginary pretend acting caps, and I want you to tell me what you think most people, aka not you, most people think of first when they hear the terms mental illness. Please feel free to just shout them out. Crazy. Great. Violent. Okay. Dangerous. Dangerous, crazy, violent. Violent. What else? Institutions. Institutions. Keep going. Keep going. Come on. Unpredictable. Unpredictable. What was it? Stable. What else? Critical. Okay, where do you think they hear about it? Media. Media. Headlines about what? Thank you. Where else? All right. Well, excellent work. Boom. This sad Drake. So for the most part, when I do this, 
Uh, and then I'll just share the darkest one is often when I speak at schools with students, the very first thing that I'll hear is shooters. Uh, so I want that to be in your mind nice and present as we go forward. So what is stigma? Stigma. Actually, you guys, go ahead. Somebody tell me a definition for stigma. Anyone, take a stop. Stereotyping, all right, good. What else? Preconceived notions. Go for it. Say the whole thing. All right, let me get one more from the back. Being scared. Being scared. Okay, those are all pretty good. We're circling a little bit closer. So stigma actually comes from a Greek word that was actually, the, it was the word for a brand that was given to people who were criminals or members of the lower class. Uh, Dr. Google defines stigma as a mark of disgrace. It's a label that we give to people when we choose one of their characteristics and decide that that's who they are. So I'm not a person who lives in New York. I'm a New Yorker. I'm not a person who suffers with depression. I'm depressive, right? Or I'm not a person who suffers with schizophrenia. I am schizophrenic. So who can give me a guess at what the difference is between stereotype and stigma? This one will raise hands for us. This one's hard. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So a stereotype, though, in common parlance, tends to have almost always a negative connotation. From a psychological human development perspective, when we talk about stereotypes, stereotypes can actually be helpful in some cases. So a stereotype is, could be we're lost and we have a stereotype of what a security guard looks like, and we know that a security guard might be able to help us. Or we have a stereotype while we're driving on a highway, we have a stereotype of what a strip mall might look like because we really have to go to the bathroom and we're driving and we notice uh, a collection of roofs in the distance and we say, oh, stereotypically that could be a strip mall I'm going to pull off here. A stigma is always negative. A stigma is a negative, is, could be another word for a negative stereotype. We never use stigma in a way that is positive. Stigma generally, there are a couple of folks who have done really pioneering work on this, and we'll talk about them for a moment. Uh, until I say their names, you can assume that all of this is clearly just my brilliance. Um, none of it is. Uh, stigma can be broken down into two types. We have public and we have private. Public stigma is what we normally think of when you think of stigma. It's what other people think of other people, right? So with mental illness, a lot of you said it. People are generally categorized into different shapes and sizes. We are either violent, childlike, or unpredictable, right? We're either dangerous, completely helpless, or just so unpredictable you don't want to work with us. Some of that sound familiar? Yeah. Private stigma, we don't talk about as much. Private stigma, I'll argue, and here's where I'm going to start to piss you off, is more dangerous than public stigma. Private stigma is what happens when a person internalizes the public stigma and starts to believe it about themselves. So they hear, I'm violent, childlike, and unpredictable. They start to believe, I am violent. I am childlike. I am unpredictable. I am bad. I am broken. I am wrong. There's something wrong with me. I can't be helped. All right, here's one of the good guys. Sir Graham Thornacroft, the Center for Global Health. Anybody ever heard of him? No? Just me? Okay, I'm the nerd. Great. Awesome. That feels nice. Uh, just look at Sad Drake. If I say something weird, just look at Sad Drake. It'll cheer you up. Um, Graham Thornacroft is a doctor over at the King's College in London. Uh, he works for the Center for Global Health. He's done so much work on looking at stigma and how it operates in the treatment of mental illness that the Queen... Uh, knighted him, which I'm told is a big deal. Uh, Thornacroft writes that stigma and discrimination in relation to mental illness have been described as having worse consequences than the conditions themselves. Why might this be? I mean, you can cheat and look at the answer. It's on there. Otherwise, somebody raise their hand. Besides you, you've already done this. Come on. Why might this be true? Yes, ma'am. Nice. Why else? Yes, ma'am. 
Mm. Beautiful. Anyone from this side? Yeah, right here. Mm. It's an interesting point. I saw another hand go up. Yes, ma'am, in the back. People internalize the stigma also. Yeah. It makes it harder to cope with your actual illness. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With regard to the private stigma, uh, it is very dangerous because people who have that private stigma are very good at masking that. Masking that. Mm. Hey, I'm really, I'm fine, but inside, they're really not fine. Yeah. Absolutely. So those are all beautiful answers. Thank you. I saw the hand. I'll get you on the next one. Um, stigma also prevents care seeking. Encourages isolation. Some of you may have heard the term that the opposite of addiction is connection. So if you're encouraging isolation, it's not really going to work out for those of us who are addicts. Also, stigma can tend to justify actions of self-harm, right? If I'm a bad person, then what's the problem with causing me, myself some harm? Uh, there are a few other doctors who then expanded on this work. Uh, Dr. Wolf Russler at, in Zurich. University of Zurich, I believe, uh, took Thornicroft's work and actually started testing it on health professionals, the people who are supposed to treat folks with mental illness. And he found that across the board, stigma affected folks in, mental, in health professions just as much as your average Joe, right? Uh, and then Dr. Bruce Link over at, the UC River, at UC Riverside did a study for Columbia University and they wrote, if health professionals want to maximize the well-being of the people they treat, they must address stigma as a separate and important factor in its own right. In other words, according to this study that they put out, if we're going to really treat mental illness, it's not just you and me in a room and maybe some medication. It's not just you and me in a room and maybe some talk therapy. That if what we really want to do is treat one person's mental illness, we need to learn to talk to everyone about this. So what's culture? Let's lighten the load a bit. What's culture? Shout it out. What happened? You guys all have the coffee wore off? Huh? Way of life. Way of life. What else? <laughs> Traditions, beliefs. beliefs. What else? Ideas. What? Shared ideas. Shared ideas. Okay, cool. Who are its keepers? Or give me, what are some of the things that you think of as qualifying culture? What like verticals or industries? Theater, nice. Yeah. Art. What else? Politics. What was that? Sports. Fashion. These are all awesome ideas. Dr. Google says, culture is the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. Those last two words are important. Um, culture, and this is where I start to get really fascinated, culture for me is the fabric, right? It's the fabric that I was referring to. It's the context in which our entire lives take place. It influences our social, cognitive, and effective learning. It impacts our values and beliefs, as someone said in the back. It impacts our priorities. It impacts which cities we choose to live in, what foods we choose to eat and order in from, right? It uh, determines which careers we want to pick. Culture is everything. And as a lot of you said, culture can be defined by music, sports, film and television, literature, fashion, social media. Let's talk about that. Way before Benz is in backpacks, man, I'm talking way before hashtags. Dr. Drake. Dr. John Naslin at Harvard reports that more and more people each and every day with mental illness are turning to social media to share their stories. I have a lot of feelings about whether or not that's good or bad, but that's a different presentation. Uh, mental health issues are frequently trending on Twitter and Instagram. I think most folks that I speak to, especially adolescents, when I ask them what's happening, who, where the conversations are, I'm often told when it comes to mental illness on social media, it feels like everyone is talking about it. What are some other examples of folks talking about mental illness in pop culture? 
Jonathan Van Ness, the star of Queer Eye, Lizzo, Selena Gomez, Robert Downey Jr., Kristen Bell, Olivia Cupo, Christy Teigen, Olivia Cupo, Supermodel, Janet Jackson, Ariana Grande, Camila Cabello, Sean Mendes, Kevin Love, Prince Harry, Carrie Fisher, Carrie Fisher, who played a princess, Prince Harry, who is a real prince, Kendall Jenner, Emma Stone, who is the most beautiful woman alive, Colton Haynes, Lady Gaga, Drake, Kanye West, Demi Lovato, Kid Cudi, John Hamm, Pete Wentz, Wayne Brady, Russell Brand, whoops, Michael Phelps, The Rock, The Rock, DeMar DeRozan, Robin Lerner, Macklemore, did I miss anyone? I missed a lot of people. Of course I did. I missed so many people. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's break down some of these examples. Last year, Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan, two of, I would argue, the top 50 players in the National Basketball Association, both came forward with full-length, long-read articles about having anxiety and panicking attacks while playing in the NBA. Kanye West releases an entire album about his struggle with bipolar disorder. Kendrick Lamar and Logic score number one hits with songs about suicidal ideation. Kid Cudi releases countless songs about his struggles with depression and night terrors. HBO's Euphoria, which is a show about a young woman who struggles with addiction and bipolar, although we're never really told that, is loud, is largely considered one of the shows of the year. Ariana Grande, Grande, I have no idea how she likes to pronounce her last name, uh, comes forward this year with a really uh, compelling share about her own struggles with mental illness after her ex, Max Miller, Mac Miller commits suicide. Actually, I believe it was an overdose. Are there any other examples in pop culture that you can think of of folks who dealt with mental illness publicly? Yes. What happened? What was her story? Okay, and she shared about it. Yes. Great. What else? That's on the back. Yes. Uh huh. What did she? What happened? Mhm. Mm Absolutely. Yes. Right here. Robin Lerner. Yes. So can you tell us what happened there? For folks who don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, starting goalie for the New York Islanders came forward about suffering with drug addiction uh, while he was the starting goalie for a National Hockey League. Yes, right here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. What was the story? Anxiety, you know, you say depression, mm -hmm. uh, suicidal tendencies. Yeah, that's one more right here. Yeah, what was the story? Thank you. So we've got some examples, eh? In fact, I, there were a lot more hands for those in the front. There were still a lot of hands up when I asked that question. So, if culture is defined the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively, if culture is the context that defines, I would argue, almost all of our decisions that we make in our lives, if it is guarded and kept by the folks who lead music, sports, film, literature, fashion, and media, and then we have all these examples, plus all the ones that weren't even shared out loud, the question that I want to ask you all, and you can split up into small groups, is does stigma still exist? I'll give you three minutes. Talk amongst yourselves. going to put me out of work. <laughs> all right. Have you all come to a consensus? How much? All right. All right. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I want to join in on this conversation. This one looks good. 
Okay. Okay. One minute, one minute. I'm Mike, by the way. Thank you, thank you. It's going to get worse. I'm Mike. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, I can send it to you. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, friends. All right, we're going to hear from four groups. Raise your hands. I'll, see. I'll go with the first four. Four groups, four groups. Raise your hands. You in the back. So, um, culturally, I think we discussed that we feel like culturally stigma is still around. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that we need to work on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think the other thing is that um, it's still not the same as it was when we were in the Uh-huh. So your answer is yes. I hear what you're saying. It's so hard to describe. You're you're getting there. Uh, uh, wait, you've already shared. Shh. Oh, yes. Okay. So the paraphrase was that for all of you tuning in at home, uh, the paraphrase of that answer was that culturally it seems to be breaking down. Am I hearing that right? But that on an institutional level, stigma still exists. Great. I don't think I've heard from you yet. Have I? Maybe one? Yeah, go for it. Yes or no? Ooh. The plot thickens. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Beautiful answer. Someone who hasn't shared yet. Yeah. Someone who hasn't shared yet? Anyone? Come on. Yes, right here. The answer is yes, it does still exist. Okay. One sentence. How do you know? Um, I work in a facility where they filter people with mental Beautiful answer. Thank you. One person who hasn't shared yet. We're still, we are still not getting casseroles when our loved ones are in the hospital. So am I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that your answer is yes. All right, so we got four yeses. I want you to keep that in mind. I also want you to remember the part of this presentation where I warned you I would piss you off. So the question I asked was, if everything we pointed out in culture is real, If we know that one in five people are going to struggle with mental illness this year, by the way, one in five people have blue eyes, okay, just to normalize that number a little bit. The answer that you all gave, or at least those four groups, uh, do most (laughs) this is going to get fun. Okay. So the answer more or less usually falls along this line, that public opinion and culture are different, right? You touched on this, that at an institutional level, uh, we tend to be behind culture. Culture tends to lead us and can help us make personal decisions, but that doesn't mean we have to then weigh that against what we know to be true at an institutional level, right? We have to weigh that against what we know to be true beyond, because we all kind of pick our own cultures, right? Some of us are like rock and roll, some of us like gangster rap, 
right? We all tend to pick our own cultures, but we exist in a world where people of many cultures exist. So, the next question is how is that possible, right? If everyone's talking about it on social media, if the celebrities that we look up to and praise and treasure are talking about it and coming forward, if we know that one in five people have mental illness or will struggle with mental illness just this year, how is that freaking possible that stigma still exists? I talked about it a bit, but ignorance, prejudice, and discrimination are strong forces. I hate to burst y'all's bubble because we're at a mental health conference and here in the industry, we love to think that we are at the forefront of the revolution, mm. right? We like to think that we are the cutting edge. My friends, we are in the dark ages of mental health, right? Who is the first, all right, stop cheating. Who is the first, the father of modern medicine? Anyone know? Wager a guess. Hippocrates, any idea when Hippocrates was around? Hippocrates is generally considered the father of modern, what we call Western medicine. Hippocrates died in the year 370 BC. Who's the father of modern psychology or mother? Yes. You know what? You know why I love that answer? Because it's wrong and it proves my point. Sigmund Freud came after. He would, he would be more recent, right? But that's who we all think of as the father of uh, who? Anybody else? Other, any other guests? Wilhelm Wundt, he started his uh, psychology institution in Germany in the year 1879. That's 120 years ago. Can you imagine trying to get treated for even a splinter in the year 200 BC? Can you imagine what it would be like if you had a common cold and sought help in the year 200 BC? Y'all, it wasn't that long ago we were putting leeches on people and hoping that that would work, okay? It wasn't that long ago that we were measuring people's skulls thinking that that would tell us something about their mental ability, right? We are in the dark ages of mental health treatment, and it is so important for us to remember that because we need to light a fire under our asses. We are just beginning here, friends, and yes, with the uh, birth of technology and media and the internet, we are moving so much faster. We're able to progress so much faster. But y'all, 120 years ain't shit compared to 3,000 plus, right? We are, we are barely scratching the surface. So we are ignorant, all of us, including those of us who think we are experts. If you need proof, please look at any of the licensure requirements for any of the myriad fields that we, we can't even agree how to treat people. We've got LMHCs, LMFTs, LCSWs, PhDs, PsyDs, psychiatrists. We can't even agree how to treat folks. And states can't even agree on how to license them. I'm in school in Pennsylvania. My license will not carry over to New York. Y'all, mental illness ain't different between Philly and New York City. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And we can't decide, and we're at the front. So we are ignorant yet. Okay? And people fear what they don't understand. Trust me, the folks who proposed that the Earth was not the center of the universe were not so popular on Twitter. Okay? <laughs> people fear what they do not understand. Prejudice and discrimination are also words that I use carefully. There are a lot of folks who can own these words just as much as folks with mental illness. But Dr. Bruce Link, our fellow from UC Riverside, reminds us that stigma always is a way of maintaining power, right? It is also most powerful when it goes unnoticed, right? Stigma benefits some people. We have to remember that. We have to remember what we are up against, and perhaps most importantly, we have to think about the ways that we in this room perpetuate stigma ourselves. I'm sorry if this is getting uncomfortable before noon, but we need to think about what are the ways that we perpetuate stigma and support these negative narratives in our own life. Look, I am very tempted to ask you all to share the mistakes that you've made publicly. I won't, but I want you to take a moment and think, have I stereotyped people? Do I use words to describe mental illness that have negative connotation? 
We often say things like crazy to refer to someone who's simply homeless on the street. What are the ways that I myself perpetuate this? Do I involve myself in education that doesn't really help my students understand the daily struggles of mental health? Do I, when I do, on the rare occasion, when I do share about my mental illness or the state of things with mental health, do I over-dramatize? Do I make this into a far bigger deal than it is? Right? Do I make it more intense? Do I intensify my own narrative in hopes of getting some attention? Y'all, I'm not going to share or ask you to share your mistake, but I'm going to stand up. I want to share a mistake that I made just three days ago. And this is hard for me to share, um, but I felt it was only right because it was so recent that I tell you this story. So I recently had a video of a, a poem that I performed a long time ago uh, start to get some traction online. Uh, it wasn't anything that would like have CNN knocking at my door. It uh, wasn't going to change my career, but it was enough that I was starting to get messages from folks who I didn't know, uh, who I will never meet, and they were thanking me um, with really lovely notes thanking me for my work. And it was a very strange experience for me because it's a piece I haven't performed in probably two years. And uh, I didn't know how to respond to these folks. I didn't know how to pretend that it was still relevant. And so I shared pretty much exactly that on my Facebook wall. And a gentleman who I wouldn't consider a friend, but at various points, maybe three points in the last 10 years, has been kind enough to And he tripled down, started goading me, uh, insulting me with things that only he really knew and was now making public. And then I snapped. I completely snapped. This guy often brags about how much money he makes on social media, talks about how often he wins, talks about how good he is frequently. And I said, oh, what's a recent example of a narcissist that I've seen? Oh, and I posted, hey, you should go see the Joker. If you don't like my work, I think that, yeah, what I wrote was, hey, if you don't like my work, maybe you'd relate to the work in The Joker. Go see it. I fucked up, y'all. I really did. That was me allowing my anger to get the better of me and then using something that I truly believe in or believe is wrong to try to hurt someone else. And that's me, the guy who does presentations on stigma for a living. Right? If I mess up, I'm willing to get some other folks mess up. And part of me fighting stigma, I feel, is me being willing to accept that I am not perfect and that I made that mistake. And writing to him and making an amends, and look, he doesn't have to respond, that's not his obligation. Right? But I, it is my obligation to understand that in that moment, my anger, my hurt, perpetuated stigma for who knows how many other people. Does that all make sense? Quick question. Yes. Was there a response? There has not been a response, no. So you didn't write back and apologize or anything like that? Mm-mm. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I have a Please. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes I can be dramatic based upon my experience and what happened. Sure. And that's not necessarily me wanting attention. Right. Is that for a very long time, there was stigma and not only a stereotype associated with who I am as a mm-hmm. black woman, mm-hmm. as a woman who grew up in poverty, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, I had a thing that thought I was really ashamed. Yeah. Sure that when I'm delivering that, it's not coming off as such without the message that I'm trying to deliver. 
I am, I am so glad that you said all that. Thank you uh, for that. That was really, really well said. And it's a really tough choice. It's a really tough line to walk. Like, if any of you come, I'm doing a double header here. I'm about to perform with Zach Sandler and, and share some of my own poetry. And you bet your ass it's dramatic, right? Like, I'm going to talk about the days that I want to die. And that's dramatic for anyone to hear, no matter how I say it, right? I, I want to be clear that what I am referring to here when I say drama, dramatization is more about uh, unnecessary exaggeration, right? Like when you take it from being the real story of your life, the honest story of your life, or I'll speak for myself. If I were to go out there uh, in, a, in about an hour and share about suicidal ideation in a way that isn't true for me, I think that is dramatization, right? But, it's, but I can't decide that for you, right? And I certainly can't control how your audience responds to it. So I think your question raises a really good point. And it also comes right back to this, right? That we're just beginning. We haven't really figured this all out yet. At least I certainly haven't. Um, but again, it's like, okay, what's true? And what are you doing just to get a rise out of people? That's the question I ask myself when I perform. And I probably don't get it right all the time. Yeah. Does that, does that answer your question, or at least touch on it? Okay, thanks. It becomes trauma porn. And, and so, um, right. A lot of it was really biographical, but he actually fabricated parts of the book so that it would sell better. Mm -hmm. So that was David uh, at its finest. He did it to sell and to make it, you know, more media worthy. Sure. But it was supposed to be autobiographical. Yeah. So, Yeah, beautiful. Thank you both. i got to keep going, but I see the hands and I appreciate them. I want to be mindful of time. I warned you that I would piss you off. Here it comes. What if stigma doesn't exist anymore? Saul Williams, who's a brilliant poet, wrote that only believers in death will die, or ever really die. There it is. What if the same is true about stigma? That only those who believe in stigma are ever really stigmatized. I may or may not believe this, but it is important for me to say it. What if stigma does not exist? What if we refuse right now for the rest of time, just us, to refuse to believe that stigma continues? What would that look like for us in our life? It would probably start on a public level. We would have to acknowledge what's actually happening, that mental health and mental illness is not some click-through BuzzFeed listicle. This is real, and it is happening to the Demi Lovatos, the Lady Gagas, the NFL players. It is happening to everyone. I'm starting to see angry and displeased faces, and that's exactly what I wanted. Okay, beyond that, we would have to give airtime to the celebrities who are actually talking about it, to the folks who are actually sharing their stories honestly. We would have to challenge our institutions. If you work in a school that only gets one mental health assembly a year, Y'all, I've worked in a school. I know how hard it is to get that second one. I know that. But can you get a bulletin board, right? Can you get permission to give a handout that's going to go back to parents? How much can you fight because stigma doesn't exist? It doesn't. It only exists if we believe it does. What if we started to focus our education on day-to-day -day mental health needs and not just emergencies? And this is where I get into hotter and hotter water. I'm treading on thin ice. What if we helped our students understand the difference between stress and anxiety? Because stress can be helpful, right? It helps you get stuff done. Okay. What if we helped them understand the difference between depression and sadness? If we gave them an education on what it looks like to have healthy relationships rather than, hey, here's a condom, don't get a disease. Right? Okay? What if we actually started to teach people 
the periodic table, and I bring this up in no way to deprioritize suicide prevention. Let's be really clear about that. I am not interested in deprioritizing suicide prevention. I have lost far too many friends to ever stand up here and share that in any way. Okay? What I am wondering is if when we hold these assemblies or these uh, infomercials that scare people, if that's all we're doing is scaring people with hotlines and emergency phone numbers and horror stories. I wonder what a world looks like where we can focus that one assembly on helping people deal with the day-to-day -day hurdles. I don't know. I don't know because that world doesn't exist. I've never seen it done, right? But I wonder what it looks like to deal more head-on with the issues that maybe the four out of five, not the one in five, are going to see every day because the one in five get it, right? The one in five have mental illness. They know it's real. How do we reach the four in five who are not coming to church, who are not members of our choir? We need to talk to them in terms they understand, and everyone will feel grief. Everyone at one point or another will not like the way their body looks. Everyone at one point or another will feel senses of isolation. These are far more common. So I wonder if this is one of our routes to ending stigma. It's by doing all of this we can simply normalize that which is less than perfect. If we can stop living in a world that expects us to post perfect selfies all the time, maybe, just maybe, we'll have a little more understanding for those who have suicidal ideations or schizophrenia, right, or bipolar, right? Maybe, just maybe, if we can understand our own shortcomings, we have a little more empathy for those who have more difficulty, right? So how do we continue to put an end to this? It's not just publicly, it's personally. What if we refuse to believe it? I'm just going to keep saying that question. What if you refuse to believe it? I don't know because I've never seen people walk out of here and really do it. I'm asking you what if. What happens if you refuse to believe in stigma? Okay, if we continue to normalize the less than perfect. And how do we do that? Just tell one less lie. One less in your whole day. Tell one less lie. If someone asks you how you are, don't say fine. Give an answer, an honest answer. I'm really tired, super uncaffeinated. <laughs> Give an honest answer. Let people know how you feel. I know you're scared to do it. I know it's scary. But us taking that leap, us being willing to talk a little bit about mental illness in our own lives and mental health in our own lives, it's going to save someone else's life, y'all. And it starts right now. So, my name is Mike Rosen. I take antidepressants every single day. I also take anti-anxiety medications every single day. I'm a recovering sex, porn, and love addict. I bet you didn't see that one coming. I struggle with anxiety and body dysmorphia, and guess what? I'm also an internationally touring artist. I'm a master's student at an Ivy League university. I am a really good hugger. You give me any dance floor, I will tear that shit up. I don't care where it is. I don't care if it's a parking lot outside. I got this, okay? And you know what else? I'm the guy that my friends call at 3 in the morning when they're scared and don't know who else to talk to. That's who I am despite and because of the depression and the anxiety and the body dysmorphia, y'all. And today, right now, for you, I'm going to renounce all hope of being anyone other than that, of being anyone other than who I am. Okay, I am going to refuse to believe that stigma exists because I don't want to live in that world anymore. I'm sick of it. I've lost too many friends to that stigma. I didn't lose friends because they didn't have help. I lost friends because they didn't want it. Right? So, with our few remaining moments, I want to give you a chance to tell your own story. Who remembers Mad Lib? A couple of us. A couple of us are too napstery for that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you a chance to write your own story briefly with a Mad Lib poem. Right? So if you have a writing or a cell phone, 
uh, bust it out, and we'll get we'll do it a little bit, and then we'll have a few moments to share those. If anybody wants, no pressure, no pressure, nobody freak out. Yes. Okay. So a Mad Lib. For those of you who missed out on this uh, important cultural phenomenon, let's 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 really focus on culture there. A Mad Lib uh, was a story that had a bunch of blanks in it, and under the blank was a cue for what you would write. So I'm going to give you a poetry Mad Lib, and I'd prefer if you didn't look at the screen. The screen is for me. I'd prefer if you kept your head down and you just wrote. And we're going to have about five minutes to complete this, so take your time. You'll have an option to share, and then you can ask me all the questions that you're so mad at me already, right? You're fired up. So I want to hear your insults and disagreements, and we can go back and forth until someone decides to kick me out. Ready? Let's start writing. First of all, you have a choice. Each line, we're going to write what's called an identity poem. An identity poem is not a formal structure. It's more of a, uh, what would we call it? A theme. It's more of a poetic theme, right, in which we get to talk about who we are and where we come from. So you can choose to start every line with either the words, I come from, or simply, I am. Ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. I come from a nickname for your hometown, followed by another nickname for your hometown, followed by a description for your home. So mine might be, I come from Big Apple, Big City, Bright Light. Your next line. Don't worry about getting it right. Worry about getting something. I come from a description for your house or neighborhood. Followed by a description of your or neighborhood. Followed by a rule you had in your house. So I come from, for me, west side, brick buildings, get your ass home by midnight. I come from one of your childhood friends' names, followed by another friend's name, followed by the nickname you give to that group of friends. Just give them a gang title. So I'm Corey Khalid, and the West Side don't give a F. <clears throat> Your next line. I come from something you and your friends used to do. Followed by another thing that you and your friends used to do. Followed by something you and your friends got in trouble for. Are we keeping good pace? Am I going too fast? Yes. Yes? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Time's up? Okay. So real quick, I'll skip down. How about I come from one thing the world might shame you for? Followed by one thing the world would be proud of you for. Followed by your favorite food and your favorite self-care activity. And y'all, time has come to a close. So if anyone needs to rush out, please feel free to. If anyone wants to stay and share, please do. Is that okay? Do we have the room for a few moments? Five minutes? Okay. 
And if anyone wants to ask me questions or challenge me, please do. My name is Mike Rosen. You can email me. Please come sign up for my list. I'll let you know. If you have schools or organizations that might want a talk, come holler. If you disagree, come debate me. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the conference. And uh, come visit me and Zach in like five minutes. We're doing this again, except different. Have a beautiful day, y'all. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Can you email it here?